Hi everybody, so in this video we're going to talk about section 3.2, intercepts, solutions, and factors. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is just solving an equation by factoring, and this should be review for you guys. Okay, so we're going to look at a couple of basic examples of solving by factoring. Okay, so since we've been specifically directed to solve by factoring, we're going to go ahead and start by factoring this. Okay, you would need to factor this by guess and check. So I would encourage you to pause the video now and go ahead and factor this for yourself. Okay, so I know that this factors as 2x and 6x, and then this is going to be minus 3 and plus 5. Okay, then the next step in solving by factoring is to set each factor equal to zero. Okay, then I'm going to finish solving each one of these linear equations. Okay, I'm going to leave my solutions as fractions. Okay, I'm not going to rewrite them as a decimal. And we can see that I have two real number solutions. Okay, all right, let's look at another example of this. Okay, so this is not in a format that we would normally solve by factoring, right? When we look at the format of the previous problem, right, this equation is in what we call standard form where we have the terms in descending order and then on the right side there's a zero, okay? So in part B, the first thing we're going to do is try to put the equation into that form. So I'm going to multiply this out. Okay, and on this side, I'm going to distribute. Okay. Now I'm going to add 3t to both sides and subtract 27 from both sides. Okay. And then I'm going to factor. Okay, now I'm going to set each of my factors equal to zero. So I get my two real number solutions, t equals 6 and t equals negative 3. Okay. All right. So there's two review examples of how to solve by factoring. Okay, so for this one, the main point that I wanted to make is that you need to simplify everything and put the equation into that standard form where you have your terms in the descending order on the left and zero over here, okay, before you start factoring, okay? All right, so let's look at our next example. Okay, so we're going to find the x-intercepts. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at is just um, this. Okay, so we know that in general to find the x-intercepts we're going to let y be zero. So for any time that we're trying to find the x-intercepts, we have that y is zero. 
Now we talked about this specifically when we were graphing lines, but this is true for any function. Okay, so I'm going to put in a zero here. Okay. Okay, and now I have exactly the same type of equation that we've been solving. So we're going to solve this by factoring. Okay, and I'm going to say what multiplies to 15 and adds to negative 8. It should be negative 5 and negative 3. Okay, so I'm going to set each of my factors equal to 0. and I get my two solutions, x equals 5 and x equals 3. Okay, now I'm not going to forget the original question, which was to find the x-intercepts. So that means that I'm going to list my answer as an ordered pair. Okay, these are my x values, and remember my y value was 0. Okay, all right. So let's talk about... Um, intercepts actually. Okay, so you can see here that to find the x-intercepts you're going to set y equal to zero. I just wanted to remind you that to find the y-intercept you would set x equal to zero. Okay, that's the same no matter what your function looks like. So we talked about that with lines, but it's true also for these quadratic functions. Okay, and we'll need that later on in the chapter when we talk about graphing. Okay, all right. So let's talk about a little bit of um, some word problems. Okay. So this is example three. Okay. One end of a 10 foot ladder is propped against a wall to reach a window. The bottom of the ladder is two feet closer to the wall than the height of the window. Okay. So this asks us to draw a picture and label it, okay, and then to choose some variables or maybe one variable and label those, okay. So right now, if you're watching the video, go ahead and pause it and draw your own picture, okay. So I'm going to draw my picture. So here's the ground and here's a wall, okay, and then I have a 10-foot ladder that's propped against the wall and it reaches this window. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to put the um, numerical values. So it says that the ladder itself is 10 feet. So I know that this length is 10 feet. Okay. Also, I'm going to mark this as a right angle because you guys know that uh, the ground and the wall would meet in a right angle. Okay. Now, the only other thing it says is that the ladder is two feet closer to the wall than the height of the window. Okay, so I'm going to label this as H, okay, and I'm going to explain over here. So H is the height of the window. Okay, so that's me choosing my variable, and I've labeled it by saying what it's equal to. Okay, now this, the bottom of the ladder, the distance to the wall should be two feet closer than this height. Okay, so we would say it's two feet less than the height of the window. Okay, so this is my picture, fully labeled. All right, so part B says write an equation. Now when you look at this picture, you can see that this is a right triangle. So what we're going to use is the Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so remember the Pythagorean theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Okay, where these are the sides of a right triangle and this is the hypotenuse. Okay, so on my triangle, my 10 is the hypotenuse and then h and h minus 2 are the sides. Okay, so my equation would look like h squared plus h minus 2 squared equals 10 squared, okay? All right, 
and the last part of my question says solve. Okay, so we're going to solve for h. So remember we had h squared plus h minus 2 squared equals 10 squared. Okay, so just like before, I'm going to try to multiply everything out and get all of my terms to the left. Okay, so h squared goes here. I've multiplied this out and then 10 squared is 100. Okay, and now I'm going to combine my like terms and subtract 100 from both sides. So I have 2h squared minus 4h minus 96 equals 0. Okay, so now I'm in a position to factor. Okay, so remember the first thing you do when you factor is look for common factors. Well, these are all even, so I'm going to factor out a 2. Okay, and then I'm going to be asking myself what multiplies to negative 48 and adds to negative 2, okay? So it should be negative 8 and positive 6, okay? I'm going to set each one of my factors equal to 0, okay? And a lot of times students will ask, well, why don't I need to set this factor equal to 0? Or what happens to the 2? Well, you can think about this two ways. Either you can divide both sides by 2, right, which will get rid of this on this side. 0 divided by 2 is still 0. Or you can say, okay, I could set that factor equal to 0, 2 equals 0, but that's not true and it's not going to lead to any solutions. Okay. So I'm going to get two solutions here, h equals 8 and h equals negative 6. Okay, now because we're talking about the height of a window and we know that it's above the ground, right, this would be below the ground, that's not going to be a reasonable answer. Okay, so we would say the window is 8 feet off the ground. Okay, word problem, so we have our sentence answer. Okay, let's look at a slightly different type of word problem that we'll see in this section with quadratic equations. Okay, a tennis ball is thrown into the air. Its height after t seconds is given by this equation. Okay, now this is why this is slightly different than the other types of examples because this one actually gives you the equation. Okay. So you'll notice it's in function notation and the questions are also in function notation. Okay, so find h of one quarter, what does it mean? Okay, so h of one fourth equals negative 16 times one fourth squared plus 16 times one fourth plus eight. Okay, so now we're gonna evaluate this Okay, so 1 fourth squared is 1 16th. Okay, so negative 16 times 1 over 16 is going to be negative 1. Okay, 1 fourth of 16 is 4. Okay, add these all together. 3 plus 8 is 11. Okay, so that answers the first part, which is find h of 1 fourth. Okay, so now we're going to answer what does it mean. Okay, so the input value is t, right, if we look at the original equation, right, and t is time in seconds. So we would say after 1 fourth seconds, right, so after a quarter of a second, and then remember the output is the height, okay, so we would say the ball is 11 feet high, 
Okay. Remember when you're answering these questions about what function notation means, there should be two parts to your answer. What does the input mean, right? What does the one quarter mean? And then what does the output mean? What does this 11 mean? Okay, so let's look at part B. For what value of t is h of t equal to zero? Okay, so we're gonna plug into our original equation, h of t equals zero. Okay, and we're gonna solve this using factoring. Okay, so we're gonna look for common factors. We can see that these are all divisible by eight. Okay, and because the leading term has a negative, we're gonna factor out negative eight. Okay, so this is gonna give me two t squared minus two t minus one. Okay. All right, so we're looking to factor this, okay? And for things that multiply to one, it really has to be one and one, okay? Then you can try and see where the signs belong, okay? This is gonna give me minus two plus one, that's not right. If I switch the signs, I would get plus two minus one, and that's not right either, okay? And this is an example of something that you can't solve by factoring. Okay, so this is just a little preview of why we want might want the stuff that we're gonna learn in the next couple of sections about solving, okay? Um, so that we can actually solve this type of equation, okay? So kind of a trick question, we can't solve it using this technique, okay? But I did wanna show you how you would set it up like this, okay? Um, and then you would need a different technique to finish solving this. Okay, so let's look at kind of the reverse of these examples. So we've been starting with equations and we've been factoring them, okay? So let's talk about when you would know the factors, okay, instead of the equation. Okay, so we're gonna write a quadratic equation with the solutions that are given to us, okay? So, okay, so we're gonna start with these two real solutions, okay? And we're just gonna talk about where these solutions would have come from, okay? So if we think about the solving process, right? We solve by factoring into two factors and then setting each factor equal to zero, okay? So we want two factors that would be zero, one for each, okay? So now this, what would be zero if x was one? Well, that's gonna be x minus one, right? You can see that this would be zero if you plugged in x equals one. What about my other factor? How can I make one that would be zero for that? Well, x plus four. If you plug in negative four, you can see that that would make this factor zero, okay? So you guys can see that each one of these factors corresponds to a single solution, right? This factor corresponds to this solution, this factor corresponds to this solution, okay? And I'm just gonna finish this up by writing my equation in standard form. So I would have x squared, right, I'm just multiplying it out, plus 4x minus x minus 4, okay? And then I'll combine my like terms. Okay. 
Okay, so this is an equation that has these two solutions. So you can see that we've done exactly the opposite of what we normally do. We've gone from solutions to factors, right? Corresponding factors, okay? And then we multiplied the factors together to get what looks like a normal quadratic equation. Okay, so what if we had different types of solutions? Okay, so this is an imaginary number, right? This, so we would say that this equation has a complex solution. Okay, so to solve this one, we actually need a little piece of information. Okay, and we need to know that complex solutions come in conjugate pairs. Okay, so in the section about complex numbers, we talked about complex conjugates. Okay, and this is another time where they come up. Okay, anytime you have a complex solution, okay, the other solution is going to be its complex conjugate. Okay, so in this example, we know that we have one solution, x equals 2i. That means the other one is going to be x equals negative 2i, its complex conjugate. Okay. So again, I'm going to write the factors that would make these zero, okay? So I have x minus 2i, okay? That would be the factor that corresponds with this solution. And then for my factor that corresponds with this solution, I would have x plus 2i, okay? Now, because you're writing an equation, don't forget this equals zero part. This is very important. Okay, and again, I'm going to multiply this out so that I have my equation in that standard form. So x times x is x squared. Okay, x times 2i is plus 2i x. Okay, and then negative 2i times x is negative 2i x. Okay, and then negative 2i times 2i is negative 4i squared. Okay, so we get x squared. These two, right, are going to cancel out. So I would have minus 4, and then remember i squared is negative 1. Okay, so this would give me x squared plus 4 equals 0. Okay. So the point of this problem, right, is that when you are looking at complex solutions, you really only need to know one of them because the other solution is its complex conjugate. Okay. Let's look at one more equation like this. Okay, so when we have these types of answers, right, these answers with the square roots in them, okay, it's another fact, okay, that solutions also come in radical conjugate pairs. Okay, so you might be thinking, what is a radical conjugate? Okay, so it has the exact same idea as a complex conjugate, right? So the whole number part is the same, okay? And the square root part is opposite number, okay? So if we have this solution, then we can guess that we would also have this solution. Now, this isn't always the case. Complex conjugates, it is 100% always the case, okay? But here, this is just something that we can say is often true, okay? So if we are looking for something that has these two solutions, right, we would say x minus 1 plus root 2, okay? 
And then here we would say x minus 1 minus root 2. Okay. And for this example, I'm actually not going to multiply these out because this takes a little bit more information about multiplying radicals. Okay. But I just wanted you to see a problem like this. So it's not just complex solutions that come in conjugate pairs, but also radical solutions will often come in uh, conjugate pairs. And we'll see why a little bit later on when we talk about some different methods. Okay. All right. Well, I hope that was some uh, good review for you guys in the beginning. And then we saw some new information about doing kind of reverse problems. Okay. I will see you guys soon.